The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was a revolutionary 90s sitcom that ran for six seasons from 1990 to 1996. But like most sitcoms, things happened along the way that ruined the show for me before it went off the air. And if you're a fan of the series, it's not when you think it is. But before we dig in, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. In order to talk about the show's death, we need to talk about its birth, and key moments leading up to its downfall. The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was loosely based on the life of co-producer Benny Medina, who was a Latin American from East LA that was eventually taken in by a white family from Beverly Hills. The creators of the show, including executive producer Quincy Jones, yes, that Quincy Jones, wanted to build the show around the young rapper Will Smith, so they named the series after his MC name Fresh Prince, and had his character come from Smith's real-life hometown of Philadelphia. And rather than having Will become adopted by a rich white family like Medina, which was also a common theme on television at the time, they had Will move in with his rich black relatives instead. Aside from being a star vehicle for Will Smith, the show also had two other significant purposes, which were to create a more authentic portrayal of black culture and to infuse the show with hip-hop culture that was sweeping the nation during the 90s. And each of these purposes were abundantly clear in the first season. The pilot episode, The Fresh Prince Project, introduced us to the show's catchy hip-hop theme song that told Will's backstory in Philadelphia when he was shooting some b-ball outside after school when a couple of guys who were up to no good started making trouble in his neighborhood. He got in one little fight and his mom got scared and said, Did you moving with your auntie and uncle in Bel Air? And the theme song actually included two extra verses for the first three episodes before it was truncated in the fourth to become the shorter version fans know it as today. Aside from the catchy theme song, the pilot episode introduced us and Will to the other main characters, who are his uncle Philip, a lawyer and stern yet loving father, Vivian, the Banks' strong-willed and accomplished matriarch, who is a college professor with a PhD, but also isn't afraid to throw down if the situation calls for it. There's also the Banks' three children, Hillary, the eldest college-age sibling, who is unemployed and equal parts a dimwit and shopaholic. Middle child Carlton is Will's polar opposite as the preppy nerd who is black on the outside, but the embodiment of white upper-class stereotypes on the inside. The youngest Banks child, Ashley, is the most down-to-earth of the three, and is often influenced by Will's rowdy behavior. And then there's the British butler, Jeffrey, who is dignified yet harbors a thinly-veiled resentment towards the family. The first two episodes of the show kept things simple, with storylines about how Will's wild and crazy attitude disrupts the Banks' family dynamic and sociality amongst their high-class peers. And we also see how Will is quote-unquote a negative influence on Ashley by teaching her how to rap and trade in her violin for the drums, which is how Will Smith's real-life musical collaborator and best friend Jazz enters the show as Ashley's drum teacher. On that note, pun intended, one of the show's longest-running gags started in episode 2, when Jazz upsets Phil by scratching his classical music record during the family's tea time, and then Phil throws him out of the house. Most of the time, they reused the same shot from episode 2 to avoid injuring Jazz with repeated takes, so it became an in-joke with fans that whenever Jazz wore that shirt, it signaled he was going to get thrown out again. Another significant element of the show introduced in season 1 was its meta humor with Will's fourth wall breaking glances to the camera. Many storylines in season 1 focused on social class issues, such as Will trying to adopt upper class etiquette after he meets a girl at his neighborhood country club or when Phil learns to publicly embrace his humble upbringing on a farm after he receives media attention for a prestigious award. Will also learns his own lessons about the distance between the life he now leads and the life he left behind, like when his mom Vi comes to visit for the first time in the episode Talking Turkey, when she gets upset over just how pampered a life Will has in the Banks' home, or when Will's best friend from Philly known as Ice Trey comes to visit, who's played by Don Cheadle, and Phil and Vivian are upset about Trey's disrespect for their lifestyle and his negative influence on Will. Another standout episode about social class issues is in Mistaken Identity, when Will and Carlton are the subjects of racial profiling and are wrongfully accused of stealing the car of Phil's law firm partner. Philip and Vivian eventually come to their rescue, where Phil delivers a powerful reprimand to the officers for illegal detaining his son and nephew. And the show ends on a somber note, as Carlton is left questioning the legal system that up to this point has served and protected him. This was only the sixth episode in the series, and would be the first of several examples of how effective the show was at tackling heavy subject matter. Season 1 also included a ton of cameo appearances, like the original Shaft actor Richard Roundtree, 
Cosby Show star Malcolm Jamal Warner, supermodel Naomi Campbell, big music artists like Heavy D, Quincy Jones, Queen Latifah, and Tevin Campbell, and pro athletes Bo Jackson, Isaiah Thomas, and Evander Holyfield. But this brings me to the only stain on season one's near-perfect record, which is that almost all of these celebrity cameos appeared in a two-part episode called Someday Your Prince Will Be in Effect. Because of all the cameos, there was quite possibly no budget left to write a good story. So in between all the cameos was a clip show. And these were the eighth and ninth episodes of the first season, which was way too early to start reminiscing about the good times when there was hardly any show to wax nostalgic about. But thankfully, some of the show's best moments were just up ahead. Season two is when I think the series took two big steps forward and just one small step back. To speak for the good, season two is when the Banks' home was updated to have the look we remember it for today, with the staircase to the bedrooms now connected to the living room, and the conjoined kitchen with the doorless entry created a seamless transition between the two main parts of the house. Season two is also when two important dance artifacts of the series were introduced, namely Vivian's dance audition and her midlife crisis episode, The Big 4-0, and Carlton's iconic dance moves in the episode Will's Christmas Show, that would become Alfonso Ribeiro's unintended pop culture legacy. And another memorable element introduced in season two was the blooper reels during the end credits that added another layer onto the show's fourth wall breaking identity. But along those lines, one of the small downsides of this season was that Will's fourth wall breaking glances only happened once in season two, which seems strange to tone way down on that area of the show's branding when there were over a dozen of them in season one. Season 2 had another standout episode about racial and societal issues in the episode Guess Who's Coming to Marry, when Will's Aunt Janice is getting married and it's revealed that her fiancé is white, which catches everyone off guard, especially Vi, who is angered by her sister's interracial marriage because of her old ways of thinking. It was interesting because of how it portrayed black people struggling to discuss race politely, just like whites or any other race of people might do in that situation too. And as sitcoms do, the story ended nicely with Will being able to help Vi let go of her old ways. But aside from that, the racial and social commentary that the show had become known for was toned down in this season to focus more on Will and the Banks' love lives. For example, in the episode Did the Earth Move For You, Will falls fast in love with a woman and gives her a ring. But later on, they get trapped in a basement and find out they can't stand each other and decide to separate. This is the first of several examples when Will's impulsive behavior in his relationships gets the better of him, and this plays an important role in how I think the show died down the road. Another important factor is when Will's player attitude is called into question in episode 8, She Ain't Heavy, when he realizes he has feelings for a full-figured woman, Dee Dee, played by Queen Latifah, but won't ask her to the school dance because she's not his usual type. In a pivotal moment, she overhears Will not standing up for her when others joke about her size behind her back, so she ends their friendship. They both arrive at the dance with different dates that they weren't really interested in. Will's date is played by Nia Long, who we'll see more of later on in a different role. But once Will and Dee Dee both catch each other trying to liven up the evening by putting straws up their noses, they fall in love in a dreamlike sequence, and then the episode ends with them snuggling up together watching television with the family. But regardless of the important life-altering lesson Will learned, and the relationship that came from it, it was all for nothing. Because after this episode, Will goes back to being his shallow player self, and Dee Dee was never heard from again. Although this isn't the worst case when the show didn't follow through on a significant plot point, it's an example of another recurring problem that would kill the show for me later on. Season 3 is when the show reached its highest ratings, but also when it started to show a little more signs of age. For example, the first episode of the season rehashed old ideas from the pilot, when Will returns to Bel Air after a summer vacation in Philly, becomes a negative influence again on Ashley, and disrupts another one of Phil's parties with his radical sense of fashion. In that same episode, the writers also borrowed a page from season 1's Mistaken Identity, where Will is racially profiled again for stealing a car when he sets off its proximity alarm while dressed like a hooligan. But this time, the racial profiling was strangely played for laughs and was quickly resolved off screen, and Will is dropped off at home by the cop who apparently became his buddy during the whole ordeal. So having racial profiling be played for laughs here felt incongruent since the topic was treated so seriously in season one. Another area where the show is spinning its wheels was with Hillary having to find another job to support herself. And this time she became a TV weather girl where she meets and falls in love with her colleague Trevor. 
but one standout episode when the show returned to its roots was dealing with social class issues in episode 2, Will Gets Committed. When Will and the Banks volunteer to clean up the Banks' old neighborhood that was destroyed by gang riots, Will meets Noah, who calls the Fresh Prince out for not being truly committed to helping his community, when Will admits he doesn't have plans to come back. The conflict is significant because of how it's a juxtaposition of the privilege Will has experienced by being lifted out of his own poverty, and now he's the one getting called out for forgetting where he comes from. Which is especially spiteful, since he called Uncle Phil out for the same reason in the pilot episode. All right, I remind you of where you came from and what you used to be. Now, I don't know, somewhere between Princeton or the office, you got soft. You forgot who you are and where you came from. In season 3, the show's overarching narrative of Will finding a family with the Banks progressed further in the episode Mommy Nearest, when Vi wants Will to move back to Philly to live with her, but Will reluctantly tells her he wants to stay in Bel Air. And in the episode Just Say Yo, Will's relationship with Carlton took more steps toward brotherly love, when Carlton is hospitalized for accidentally taking Will's amphetamines, who in the end sincerely apologizes and tells Carlton he loves him. And Carlton reciprocates Will's sincere feelings in the season finale Six Degrees of Graduation, when Carlton gives the valedictorian speech and implies that Will is his best friend. And Will responds by mouthing the words, You the man, during the applause. Despite this, they continue to antagonize each other as the series moves on. But this season showed that underneath their petty rivalries, they really do care for one another like brothers. Another area of the family that developed in Season 3 was Vivian announcing she's pregnant to coincide with Janet Hubert's real-life pregnancy that in Episode 20 led to the birth of the Banks' newest son, Nicholas, or Nikki for short. But because of Vivian's pregnancy, Vivian's presence felt muted throughout the season, with most of her appearances feeling brief and only revolving around food cravings and mood swings. But unfortunately, things would only get worse for Janet Hubert in Season 4 when she was forced out of her role and replaced by Daphne Maxwell-Reed. Now enough could be said about this old controversy to deserve its own video. But to summarize, due to Hubert's personal struggles at home, including abuse, there were behind-the-scenes tensions that motivated Will Smith to have NBC give Hubert a lousy deal for season 4, where she would have been forced to take a pay cut by appearing in less episodes, and she also would have been legally obligated to not work on any other projects outside of the show. So given those terms, Hubert felt forced to walk away from the role, despite the effect it would have on her family, career, and her reputation. So Daphne Reed stepped into the role, who was offered the part early on, but turned it down because she didn't want to work with a rapper. It was a decision Reed would regret once she saw how fun the show was, so she jumped at the chance to play Vivian when the role was offered to her again. Now many of you might have been thinking when you clicked on this video that this would be when I think the show died, because to use Will Smith's words, There was a certain foundational element that was broken when Janet left. But although I do agree with Will's statement, and I liked Hubert's strong assertive version of Vivian over Reed's softer approach, I still think the show had more life in it despite this jarring change in the family dynamic. <laughs> Having said that though, I do have very mixed emotions about season 4 because of the show's lack of commitment to take the risks it proposed. The worst example of this is in the two-part season opener, When There's a Will, There's a Way, because of several big plot points that were introduced and weren't followed through. For starters, Carlton and Will are in college now, so they move into an apartment, but by the end of the second episode, they're evicted and move back to Bel Air to live in the pool house where Hillary used to live with her boyfriend Trevor. On that subject, in the first episode, Hillary surprises everyone that she and Trevor are preparing for marriage. But this is also reversed in the second episode, when Trevor pops the question while bungee jumping on live TV, and then tragically yet hilariously died when he hits the ground. Will you marry me? <laughs> so Hillary moves back home too. Now I agree that keeping everyone under the same roof was better for the show because having three members of the cast move away, especially one of them being the star, would have harmed the show because of how difficult it would have been to maintain the family dynamic with all the kids living in separate places. But pitching the idea and reverting everything back to normal so quickly like this was a bait and switch, and just felt like a waste of time. Another missed opportunity introduced in the season 4 opener was with Will reuniting with an old friend Jackie, played by Tyra Banks who moved from Philly to attend ULA on a scholarship. It's made clear that there's chemistry between them, and Will has remained interested after all these years. And to thicken the plot, Will finds out Jackie works at the campus store, The Peacock Stop, 
and she offers him a job to keep him close by. But despite this will-they-won't-they they friendship lasting 12 episodes, it never amounts to anything. Because in the episode You've Got to Be a Football Hero, Will confronts Jackie's boyfriend Hank in an act of jealousy, and tries to prove himself the better man by beating Hank in a drinking contest. Jackie gets upset about the pointless contest for her affection, and asks Carlton to take her home, and leaves the show without a trace. No heart-to-heart -heart with Will to explain why she's done with him, and where she's going to go from there. She's just gone. And in episode 15, Who's the Boss?, Carlton replaces her as the store manager. The only significant storyline in this season that did seem to stick was Jazz getting married to his girlfriend, Jewel. But I'll talk more about that later. But what saved season 4 from completely going downhill were more very special episodes that dealt with heavier topics. Like another story about racial and social class issues in Blood is Thicker Than Mud. When Carlton is persecuted and ultimately rejected from a fraternity he wants to join because the leader looks down upon him for his high-class upbringing. Another story that affects Carlton deeply is in the episode Home is Where the Heart Attack Is, where as the title implies, Phil has a heart attack and Carlton can't bring himself to visit his father in the hospital because he can't cope with the fact that his dad won't be in his life forever. This strikes a heavy chord with Will who is angered and calls out his cousin for being selfish because Will mentioned he has no relationship with his father and doesn't even know where he is. Which brings me to the best episode of the entire series that answers that question. And Papa's got a brand new excuse. When Will's father, Lou, who is a self-employed truck driver, tries to re-enter his son's life after 14 years of being absent. Will is reluctant to accept his father's plea, but he eventually opens up his heart to embrace Lou as his dad and accepts an invitation to join him on the road for the summer so they can spend some quality time together. But when it comes time to leave, Will is crushed to find out Lou has made a change of plans at the last minute and leaves his son behind. And what follows is arguably the most heartbreaking monologue ever performed in a sitcom. How come you don't want me, man? The season could have ended there, and perhaps it should have, because the next episode was another clip show that stemmed from the Banks family reminiscing about the good times while attempting and failing to sell their home to Donald Trump. And season four failed to stick the landing in its final episode, The Philadelphia Story, when Will and the Banks go back to Philly to visit Vi and check out their old neighborhood. The idea for the story was interesting because it was a chance to flesh out Will's backstory and what made it even better was when Will finds out his reputation has been tarnished since he left, because everyone thinks he's a chicken for running away from his problems. So Will prepares to confront his old bully, that he jokes was the guy twirling him over his head in the opening credits. And after a rocky training montage, Will finds out the guy has changed his life around, and now gives back to the community. So this convinces Will he's got nothing to run from anymore, and the season ends on a cliffhanger when Will shocks the family by telling them he's going to stay in Philadelphia. But as we already know from season 4, the creators seem to understand that the show couldn't survive with its main cast split up. So at the beginning of season 5, they did a quick bait and switch again by having NBC executives show up in the cold open to take Will back to Bel Air. And then the rest of the episode was about a completely different storyline. Having said that, I'll give them some credit that this deus ex machina moment was at least on brand by breaking the fourth wall with the signature meta humor. But in this case, it just felt lazy and cheap to return everything back to normal so quickly and inexplicably after baiting viewers with such a big cliffhanger between seasons. Like the season 4 opener, this demonstrated again that the creators weren't intending to follow through with this new storyline. And yet again, this all felt like a waste of the viewer's time. And unfortunately, the rest of the season didn't get much better in that regard. Season 5 shook things up by almost entirely focusing on Will's relationship with his newest girlfriend, Lisa, played by Nia Long, who he met in episode 6, Will's Misery. But this was also another storyline that ended up being for nothing. To begin with, Lisa and Will's relationship started off very problematically when she invites Will to her family's cabin for their second date. But that's when she turns psycho on him and ties him up as a prank in order to get into a sorority that has it in for Will's womanizing behavior. 
but when Will escapes her trap, she tells him the truth about what she's doing and admits it was Carlton's idea and reveals that she really does like him and wants to continue dating. So then Will is automatically relieved despite the trauma she's caused him and decides to play along with her prank to help her get initiated. Even for sitcom standards, this is a pretty far-fetched way to establish what would become Will's longest-lasting and most serious relationship. As a side note though, the one redeemable quality about this episode was Carlton's reaction to Will getting back at him by implying that he had to kill Lisa to escape, which sends Carlton in a fourth wall breaking frenzy by running amok throughout the entire studio. Even though Will and Lisa's relationship was poorly conceived, as the season developed, they seemed to fall genuinely in love with each other. And Will even showed signs of growth to become a mature and faithful man, which was a refreshing direction to take his character given his usual player attitude. Will's love for Lisa and his overall direction in life would drastically change in the episode Bullets Over Bel Air, when Will gets shot trying to protect Carlton while being robbed at gunpoint at an ATM. While recovering in the hospital, Will discovers that Carlton has bought a gun, and after a heated discussion, Will is able to get Carlton to hand it over as payback for saving his life. Give me the gun! I saved your life! I want the gun! Although this scene doesn't land as heavy as the episode about Will's father, it is still remembered by fans as one of the best of the series. And because of Will's brush with death, he realizes how precious life is, and in the following episode A Decent Proposal, Will pops the question, but it's quickly revealed that Lisa has doubts, and she eventually admits Will is overreacting from all the trauma he's gone through. But Will reassures Lisa his love is real and isn't going to change. However, if the show has taught us anything, it's that one of Will's weaknesses is rushing into things with his girlfriends before he fully realizes the consequences of his choices. And the show itself has exhibited that same behavior by constantly going down directions it never fully committed to. Up to this point, Will and Lisa's relationship was the longest plot line the creators followed through on, so that's what made its reversal sting even more. In the season 5 finale, For Whom the Wedding Bells Toll, seeds of doubt about Will's marriage are planted by Jazz, who conveniently just divorced Jewel in time for this episode, explaining that he didn't really know his wife. And soon after, Lisa also conveniently reveals to Will that her real name is Beulah. Your name is Lisa, isn't it? <laughs> well, it is now. I mean, I just couldn't go through life hearing people say, Hey, Beulah! <laughs> So with those doubts in mind right before the wedding, Will and Lisa get apprehensive about their marriage, and at the altar they come to grips that they should separate, because they're two totally different people. But the wedding isn't a total loss, because following in her son's footsteps, Vi and Lisa's dad Fred conveniently fell fast in love in this episode and rushed into their own marriage by taking Will and Lisa's place at the altar. But yet again, this was all just for show because after this episode, Vi will continue to appear without Fred, and her marriage will never be discussed again. Something the show did commit to was to end the series at the end of season 6, and in that season, it was evident that the end was near, because the show felt like it was mostly just coasting by rehashing old ideas. In episode 1, Burning Down the House, Will sets the kitchen stove on fire like Hillary did back in season 4. And in that same episode, Will ruined yet another dinner party like he did at the beginning of seasons 1 and 3. Another rehashed storyline was in episode 8, Viva Las Wages, where Will and Carlton get themselves into money trouble and have to dance to earn it back like they did in season 2. The lackluster sixth season ended on a high note in the two-part series finale, I Done, which was a gift the show was able to give its fans by knowing when the end was coming. But unfortunately, the end had already come much earlier for me, during the season 5 finale for Whom the Wedding Bells Toll on May 15, 1995. Because at that point, the series had gone too far by teasing several big story ideas without following through with any of them. And the last bait and switch to end Will and Lisa's wedding was the final blow that killed the show for me. Click a video on the screen to enjoy more great content right here on Fun Fact Films.